Alright guys, whoops, um, trying to get this done here, bleeding time here before the exam. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is going to cause changes in social structure. Uh, we have on top for many, 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 many years the old aristocrats, as I, as I was telling you in class. They transferred from being nobles to the big business owners to um, the bankers, the merchants, the landowners where the, where the land was built. However, because of the Industrial Revolution, we have a new class, the middle class or the bourgeoisie. And the members of the bourgeoisie were successful, but they didn't have like a large reserve of money. So they cannot match toe to toe the nobles in wealth, the upper classes. And they had for years been trying to climb and achieve the rungs of power. They had been blocked every possible avenue or way they tried, they find themselves blocked. And while individually they can't do it, their strength is in their numbers. And as the middle class becomes more and more and more powerful. The nobles cling even tighter to power. And you remember back to Aristotle where he said, he who wants to win the election needs to get the middle class on their side. Their average everyday Joe, their average everyday Susie. They get up, they go to work, they do their jobs, they pay their taxes, they take care of their families. And they're kind of invisible because there's so many people. It's every man, it's every woman. And they're doing their jobs. Eventually, the middle class begins to gain more power. However, unfortunately, as soon as they begin to acquire power, they quickly forget where they came from, is the saying. They begin to hold down and suppress the lower classes. They do the same thing to the lower classes that the upper classes were doing to them. And they say, because you lower classes, you're lazy, you're slovenly, you don't have a job, you're a drain on resources. And while they didn't like being suppressed by the upper classes, they don't mind doing it to others. And so the people who are going to suffer the most at this time are the, industri uh, are the skilled artisans, skilled laborers, your carpenters, your blacksmiths, your, your printers. They had been able to maintain their guild practices, right? where in their town or their city, every member of their guild, every blacksmith was guaranteed an equal amount of work so they could maintain their job and their household. They would agree on a specific price for an item, the same price and the same quality of an item. But the Industrial Revolution is going to threaten this. Industrialization makes it possible to make the same product faster, cheaper, and quicker. So if Connor is a blacksmith and he makes a set of horseshoes, four horseshoes, say they're eight bucks, and they'll last for six months. So every year to shoe your horse, it's going to cost you $16. Well, all of a sudden, industrialization cranks out horseshoes. Chunk, 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 chunk. They only last for a month or two, but they only cost a dollar a set. Connors cost eight bucks. They're well made, they're high quality, they last six months. But these are a dollar. And while they might only last a month, well, if I get a new set every month, that's only $12. I've just saved four bucks. Now, it's a bizarre example, but Connor starts losing business. And once the factories are built, the stonemasons and the carpenters who build the factories, like Charlie Bucket's dad, who lost his job being a toothpaste tube cap screwer on her, is now out of work, or Bob at Lordstown. And this then is going to change the, uh, not only the social structure, but the family 
classes as well. The social classes in the Industrial Revolution are based on financial status. We've got the industrial businessmen and the bourgeoisie, and we've got the middle class, all right, doctors, lawyers, and industrial technicians. The bulk of the people are what's known as the proletariat, average Joe, factory workers, farmers, and poor folks. And this is where family structures are going to change. Throughout the Industrial Revolution, throughout much of world history for that matter, families worked together. Mom and dad would teach their sons and daughters the skills they need to do the job. When to plant, when to harvest, how to build, how to doctor, how to you know, look after animals, how to sew, how to cook, how to do whatever. You learn your trade. Their home life and their economic life are interwoven. But now, because of industrialization, fathers are going to go to work in factories. And they are going to be separated from the home for many hours a day. 8, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. You're working that long. Then you've got to factor in commuting time getting to work and home from work. So dads may be you know, at work or traveling 14 hours a day. Well, they got to sleep 6 or 7 hours. That only leaves you an hour or two to see the family. And dad is so tired by the time he gets home. He's not as energetic and fun as he used to be. So by the mid-1830s, most textile production no longer took place in the little villages during the wintertime. They're run by machinery. These machines also require workers with no skill. I have to pay a highly skilled worker a lot of money but I only have to pay a low-skilled worker a little bit of money. Like McDonald's in New York City doing away with cashiers, and you do it on a little touch screen. So with fathers gone 12 hours a day, children were no longer receiving any education at home. Mom now has to do the work of both parents to tend the, the home. Come on in. Whatever you're doing. Mom now has to take care of the home, tend the children, and take care of the farm animals and the farm labor. I wonder who that was. I got it. All right. Farm animals, farm labor, and do all the things of mom and dad, plus look after the children. So all of a sudden, um, children, just, you know what? We need as many hands as we can making money, so children go off to work in factories. And the plight of child labor becomes well documented. Many people are thinking about it. What are we doing? And since children are no longer being taught by their parents, their discipline and their manners are transferred to the workplace. Right? And so here you have little kids up here, barely tall enough to stand. Hey, you're going to wind this wool or cotton into thread, and if the belt gets stuck or the, the arm, you just stick your hand in there and pull it out. And if your arm gets ripped off, well, you got another one. So, um, after a while, with child in, um, injuries and child work time, in 1835, the English Factory Act is passed. And the English Factory Act will dictate that children cannot work any more than eight hours a day. After that, they must attend two hours of education paid for by the factory. So you guys complain about sitting in school all day and listening to fat, bald guys like me drone on and on and on. How about you become this little kid, all right? You work in a sweatshop eight hours a day, and then you get to go um, to school. So, things aren't all bad. Not all children are working, you know, eight hours in a factory. And some dads are able to make more money as factory workers than they did back on the farm. So some children 
No longer have to go to work and get up and work on the farm and mend fences and slop hogs and milk cows. In some cases, instead of going to work, these middle class kids can actually go to <coughs> school. Yes. Where they can learn and get educated. And when you get an education, you learn how to think. And when you think, you the light bulb of knowledge kicks on. Every parent wants their child to do better than themselves. Wait a minute. We've been getting repressed for years by the social and the political system. The avenue out of this is education. And for women, there are also some positives and negatives. Some cases, families can live on the wages of the factory worker father. All right, dad goes to work and comes home. And this will allow for traditional, stereotypical gender roles, right? Mom takes care of the house and dad goes to work. And, and, and part of the job for middle and upper class women um, was to support the family, to create a, a welcoming home in, in environment. So when the kids come home from school in the old days, you had like chocolate chip cookies and Kool-Aid and hey kids, let's have some decompression time and get your homework. And when dad gets home, he's got a, you know, a cup of coffee and his pipe ready to go and hey dear, how was your day? Nowadays, we're not allowed to have Kool-Aid because it will cause your eyeballs to fall out and, and, and cookies will cause cancer. So you guys come home from work and mom's like, oh, or dad, um, let's have some, you know, kale chips with um, lightly salted with sea salt and some tri-filtered, you know, Fiji water, Fiji water, Fiji water while you do decompress by doing Sudoku puzzles and playing Scrabble. It's this warm, friendly, that's a little joke, everyone, a warm, friendly um, mentality, right? You have the home environment. Mom or stay-at-home dad is responsible for the home environment. But in this day and age, in contextual history, it's mom. And mom also is in charge of the finances, right? Paying the bills, managing the checkbook, the bank account. And this gives the moms a sense of empowerment, something they haven't had in world history. Mom has got to make the hardcore financial decisions, make sure the family is fed, bills are paid, because dad is working 12, 14, 16 hours a day. And for some young women, the growth of cities allow them to have a choice. For the first time, a woman has an option of deciding who she's going to marry. Farmer Smith's daughter doesn't have to marry Farmer Brown's son because the families are friends and, well, they're the only two people in the area. Right? A girl born in the countryside can move to the city and earn enough money for her own dowry, the amount of money that is paid to the husband's father. This gives her a greater sense of choice. She can actually choose who she's going to marry and not be betrothed to Farmer Brown's son. However, there is a dark side to this. Girls lived in dormitories. They were supervised by, like, you know, dorm, you know, mothers. But a lot of these women worked low-skilled factory jobs, and they were often exploited. They had to work in worse conditions for lower wages than the men. Like the great, you know, triangle shirtwaist factory where people were locked upstairs in a sweatshop um, for a low wage and when it catches on fire, the young girls couldn't get out and they all died. Um, also, they were subject to constant harassment. They had no protections. They could be easily exploited because where were they going to go? And while the family unit doesn't disappear um, together, um, family ties were loosened. Um, you know, like my two sisters, one lives three miles from my parents, the other one five. It's the Northeast Ohio death mentality. But, but you know, some people never leave. But now, 
Family ties were loosened because people are traveling, they're leaving the country, they're going to a different city. Money could be sent or transferred over long distances. So the children would move away from home so they could go find a better job. They could send that money home, but there's no longer that daily close contact. And so what we have is a little thing known as proletarianization. And proletarianization um, is an idea of where people lose control of the factors of production. Proletarianization occurs when workers lose control of the quality and the price of an item. And this is a point brought up by Karl Marx that he says the bourgeoisie is going to exploit, exploit the lower classes. Now this happens to some factory workers and urban artisans in Northern Europe. They go through this process. Before, when you were in your guild, you controlled the quality of the item and the price. That no longer happens. Your job is to work. Right? You supply labor for a salary. Human schedules are set up to match those of the machines. The employee doesn't matter. It's the machine that does. You simply supply labor for a salary. You are subordinate to the will of the factory. The tools and the equipment and the, the tools of your trade that they used, um, your labor practices are all now dictated to you. What was the, of the utmost important is maintaining a smoothly running and efficient machine. So stonemasons and people who build the factories, as I said, once the factories are completed and operational, sorry, I don't need you anymore. The high salaries of the highly skilled artisans are too high. So I can bring in Bob. I can bring in Richard Robert and Ricky Bobby. I can bring in someone from the countryside or a migrant worker traveling around England looking for work. I can pay them lower wages and in worse working conditions because they have no skills. And as less skill is needed to run the factory, workers become less valuable. A machine can run all day, every day. It doesn't need a rest, it doesn't need a break, you don't need to feed it, it doesn't need to go to the bathroom. So artisans lose this control of the means of production. And so guys begin to compete. Um, you know, you go to a tailor and a tailor makes a suit that fits you. Well, in order to compete, instead of making handmade clothes with factory-made clothes, we get three sizes, small, medium, and large. If you have a size 11 foot, and only size nine shoes are made, all right? Um, it's now one size fits all. If your foot is smaller than a nine, your shoe flops around. If your size foot is bigger than a nine, then you have to squish your foot into it. I can't tailor make or make specific sizes to compete with the factories. This is known as the um, confection, where it's one size um, fits all. So I will get anybody I can as the business owner, to do the most work for the cheapest price that I can. That's the way I make more money. And so, um, coming up to this, we have new ways of thinking about it. The Industrial Revolution will force nearly everybody else in the world to react. The, and this is the distribution of wealth in the Industrial Revolution. You see Western Europe, you see Great Britain and the United States really big, like South America, Africa, you know, Asia, you know, India and Japan are a little big, but everybody else is small. 
The Industrial Revolution forces nearly everyone in the world to react. Africa and South America become nearly completely dependent on the West. In Asia, Japan tries to imitate Western Europe and the United States. Well, China, despite her enormous size and vast wealth, is exploited. Southeast Asia and the Middle East are colonized to supply resources to Western countries. But industrialization as a whole is one of the most rapid quantum leaps forward in all of world history. It's one of the biggest things, remember that, that short answer we did on the Neolithic um, Revolution. It's one of the biggest quantum leaps forward of all time. And it comes at a cost for much of the planet. Industrialization gives Europeans vast amounts of new goods to sell. It is the first truly global market. As Western Europe and the United States will, it's like a triangle trade. They will extract raw materials from the rest of the world, Africa, South America, Asia, and even parts of North America, in return to supply finished products. As a result, much of the non-industrialized world becomes dependent upon Europe and the United States, thus allowing Western Europe to dominate the globe for hundreds of years. All right, on Monday, we are going to start and we are going to look at laissez-faire and capitalism, and we will find out, is there justice in the world for this shark and for this shark? So, then we'll also talk about this. So, um, this is going to lead us into the uh, colonization unit, nationalism unit, so keep your eyes open for that, and hope at least a few of you watch this, and have a good weekend, everybody.